today we are going to talk about hypoxia, hypoxemia, its causes and mechanisms, right? How do you define hypoxia? Hypoxia is reduced delivery of oxygen to tissues. That's so simple. What is hypoxia? Okay, why the star is there? Hypoxia. Okay, put it here. Hypoxia is reduced supply of oxygen at tissue level, right? Now, uh, before really I go for the causes of hypoxia and mechanisms of hypoxia, I will briefly review how normally oxygen goes through tissue. And then we will be talking about the mechanisms which produce hypoxia. You know that major function of respiratory system and cardiovascular system is to take the oxygen and other nutrients to the tissue and take away the waste product including the carbon dioxide. Fine, we start with the lungs. Let's suppose here is your lung. I will just draw one lung and your, yes. It's a very simple diagram of course. And here is your right heart. Which valve is this? Now, this is pulmonary. What is it? Pulmonary, yes. Okay, pulmonary artery. And then here is pulmonary capillaries, isn't it? Right. And eventually, oxygenated blood through the pulmonary veins going to left heart left heart right fine so in this diagram what we are showing that there is a lung and there is we are showing the vascular connection between the lung and the right heart and the left heart right heart is pumping the blood to the lungs through pulmonary arteries then pulmonary capillaries, then blood gets oxygenated and oxygenated blood through the pulmonary veins go to the left heart and then left heart is pumping the blood to the systemic circulation, isn't it? And from the systemic circulation, naturally there are arteries going to different tissues, breaking down into, yes, capillaries, which are systemic capillaries. And systemic capillaries are thin walled and allow the exchange of gases and nutrients, provide the oxygen, provide the nutrients to the peripheral tissues, and of course, through the capillaries, we take up carbon dioxide and other waste products so they can be eliminated from the body. Capillaries drain into venules and through eventually into systemic venous system. Now, for normal supply of oxygen, what are the requirements? First, we will talk about what are the requirements for the normal supply of oxygen. Requirement number one is that there should be enough oxygen present in, yes, inhaled, here. Yeah, so, atmosphere, ferric oxygen should be normal, number one. Number two, number one, whatever gases you are inhaling or air you are inhaling, it should have at least 21% of oxygen. Is that right? Secondly, the conductive pathway which conduct the air to the alveolar system, they should be normal. There should not be any obstruction to the conductive pathway or bronchi or bronchioles should not be obstructed, right? Next is that there should be enough, okay, number one point was atmospheric oxygen or oxygen coming should be normal. Number two, conductive pathway should be normal. Number three, yes, that your ventilatory process, 
you know ventilatory process mean that your central nervous system is driving the muscles for the inspiration and that neuromuscular operators should be normal because there is no fun in having enough oxygen in the air and all the pathway open but if your respiratory pump is not working because for uh, having supplying the oxygen to the blood we need two things number one lungs should be working normally but only normal lungs are not enough during inspiration and expiration lungs should be changing their size so that they can during inspiration they can take the air in and during expiration they can throw the air out and that function is provided mainly by the neuromuscular system is that right so that should be normal right that is called respiratory pump right so here i will make your central nervous system where is the inspiratory center that's very good in middle line and from there the lower motor neurons are coming out and they are supplying intercostal muscles they are supplying diaphragm and other muscles which are involved in inspiratory effort so again to get the normal oxygen delivered at this point we have to bring the oxygen here number 1 oxygen should be normally present in the inhaled air number 2 conductive pathway should be okay number 3 inspiratory effort by the pump respiratory pump respiratory pump consists of the chest wall bones thoracic cage and intercostal muscles and diaphragm right and their coordinated effort produce inspiration and expiration this should be functioning normally right after that of course this gas exchange membrane that should be normal it should have enough surface area and it should be enough thin not thick right this gas exchange area where alveolar membranes and the endothelial membranes of the pulmonary capillaries they come in touch is that right they should be healthy there should be enough surface area because we will discuss many diseases reduce the surface area there are some other diseases which increase the thickness both of them will reduce the transport of transfer of oxygen from alveoli to the blood so how many things are normal atmospheric oxygen is normal conductive pathway is normal uh, what is this respiratory pump and its control is normal and then gas exchange area that normal is that right so if all these things are normal oxygen will be brought here but once oxygen has been transferred to the blood it has to be taken to the tissues is that right to take it to the tissue then you have to have heart normal you have to have your circulatory pump normal and even that is not enough to provide normal amount of oxygen to every tissue the arterial supply and circulation through every tissue should be normal for example if i have all these things normal but an artery going to my kidney is blocked kidney will develop hypoxia at tissue level organ level you get it or not so it is also important that not only heart should be pumping the blood and maintaining cardiac output but it is also important that all the organs in the body should have su sufficient circulatory activity and for sufficient circulatory activity you should have enough arterial supply to the tissue level number 6 and of course proper drainage level number 7 because it's quite possible that in some tissue if you block the veins then blood will stagnate into the microcirculation and if if pressure become very high due to exit of the blood is blocked right then more blood cannot come and stagnant blood all oxygen will be used and then tissue will experience hypoxia so it's very sad that some of the students when they talk about hypoxia their mind is somehow fixated on the lungs right you have to go beyond your doctor you are not treating lungs you treat human beings right so what really happens you have to develop an integrated concept that first of all what is the definition of hypoxia hypoxia is a situation in which there is reduced supply of oxygen to tissues so we have to talk about the concept from atmosphere up to the tissues 
Right. And once oxygen is there in the tissue, it plays a major role in aerobic respiration. Is that right? Intracellularly, enzymes use the oxygen. You know, cytochrome in the mitochondria, the mitochondrial enzymes which utilize the oxygen, right? And break down some fuels, biological fuels like carbohydrate and fats and produce energy to convert ADP into ATP. Now listen. The last cause of hypoxia is within the cell. Because if in the cells, the enzymes which use oxygen, if those enzymes are defective, for example, someone has cyanide poisoning, and cyanide uh, poison specially binds with the cytochromes, and cytochrome enzymes or mitochondrial enzymes become dysfunction, oxidative respiration cannot be maintained. Oxygen is there, but can it be utilized? No. So for the metabolic processes of cells, oxygen cannot be utilized. It is equivalent to having deficient oxygen at cellular level. Even though, in fact, oxygen is there, but cell is unable to utilize it. But that is also classified as hypoxia. This point highlights that it is not enough to take the oxygen to the tissue cells. Rather, to it is also important that cell metabolic enzymes should be able to utilize oxygen in a normal fashion. Is that right? Again, we were talking about hypoxia. What is hypoxia? Hypoxia is reduced delivery of oxygen to the tissues to be very, very straight, reduced supply of oxygen to the tissue enzymes or reduced utility of oxygen by the tissue enzymes. That's a very exact definition, conceptually speaking. Right? Again, if someone develops hypoxia, what could be the causes? Causes may be in atmospheric oxygen. Let me give you an example. If you go very high on altitude, right, the atmospheric pressure becomes less and oxygen percentage in the air becomes? It does not become less. This is a wrong concept. Even at uh, very high mountains, percentage of oxygen is 21%. Problem is that atmospheric pressure is less, so oxygen pressure in alveoli become less. The pressure which drives the oxygen through whole system is less. Even if you go to high mountains, oxygen is still around 21-20%. Is that right? So it is not the reduced oxygen really, it is the reduced atmos atmospheric pressure, so air becomes thin. But as far as percentage is concerned, oxygen is still 20 to 21 percent. Is that right? So, actually we can say that percentage of oxygen at high levels, high altitude is normal, but because of reduced atmospheric pressures, supply of atmospheric oxygen to the lungs is reduced. Is that right? Or sometimes it happens that, yes, in operation theta, when you have anesthetized your patient, you are giving mixture of different gases. If by mistake, while giving anesthesia gases, you reduce the oxygen percentage less than 21%, you are exposing your patient to the risk of hypoxia. Is that right? So hypoxia may be due to this reasons. Or here, when there is airway obstruction, you must have heard of the disease called asthma. In asthma, what happened? There is generalized bronchoconstriction. So naturally, uh, oxygen supply to the alveoli will be reduced. Is that right? And eventually hold down the system, oxygen supply will be reduced. We can move forward. Cause number three. Maybe someone has taken some drug which depresses the neurons in medulla. For example, you have taken toxic doses of morphine. Right? They depress the medulla and inspiratory drive become less. Or there is some disease which produces demyelination of neurons, right? Demyelination of the nerves and neurons which are moving the intercostal muscles and diaphragm. If these are demyelinated and these nerves are dysfunctional, like I mean phrenic nerves and intercostal nerves, they are dysfunctional in spite of normal oxygen outside, in spite of the open, you can say, airways, you cannot maintain ventilation. Is that right? So there may be problem with medulla or problem may be with the nerves like demyelination, Gyambare syndrome, you know, or you don't know. Anyway, 
there may be problem with the muscles myasthenia gravis muscles are not neuromuscular junctions are not functional and respiratory effort is less producing the hypoxia to the patient or move forward problem with this exchange area gas transfer area maybe it is too thick and fibrotic or it may be it is destroyed in a disease called do you know any disease in which this exchange area is destroyed emphysema emphysema in emphysema there is excessive destruction of septa right intralveolar septa then there can be everything is okay here problem start beyond that right what is problem here that maybe hemoglobin level is so low that in spite of supply of oxygen up to the blood level is normal your blood is unable to carry enough oxygen that may produce anemic hypoxia is that right then you can come to the left heart if someone has a failing left heart and her left heart is producing very little cardiac output so naturally if there is very little cardiac output it means blood is circulating very poorly especially if there is biventricular failure left heart fails as well as right heart fails if circulation is very very slowly moving naturally uh, blood is taking longer in the tissues time and total per minute supply of blood to the tissues is reduced and of course then oxygen supply is also reduced or there may be problem with the selective tissue hypoxia that a particular tissue has either its arterial supply blocked by a thrombus classical example is coronary artery in the coronary artery there is thrombus and you may develop ischemia or hypoxia in the myocardium is that right or you may develop a problem that venous outflow from a tissue is blocked for example if renal vein is thrombosed if renal vein is thrombosed then naturally blood flow going to the kidney is not maintained well is that right or eventually in the end if enzymes fail right like cyanide poisoning so this concept is clear that next time in your life when you think of hypoxia you have to think of this diagram from top to down problem may be anywhere right now we classify hypoxia according to classical fashion as usually it is defined in most of the books there are four types of hypoxia mechanisms of hypoxia we'll talk later hypoxia yes first of all we'll talk about the types of hypoxia yes who will tell me the types of hypoxia number one is hypoxic hypoxia number one group is hypoxic hypoxia hypoxic hypoxia include all those causes of hypoxia in which there is problem either with the atmosphere or inspired air or problem with the airways or problem with the gas exchange or problem with ventilation perfusion mismatches or problem with your neuromuscular apparatus for inspiration expiration actually the real definition of hypoxic hypoxia is that hypoxic hypoxia is a situation in which there is reduced oxygen partial pressure in pulmonary what is this pulmonary veins it means that when blood is passing through the lungs somehow whatever the mechanism blood is not properly oxygenated right if blood is not properly oxygenated right or we say that there is reduced supply of oxygen from the lung to the blood this is considered hypoxic hypoxia it means atmospheric uh, deficiency of oxygen is also part of hypoxic hypoxia obstructive airway disease if airways are obstructed that is also a cause of hypoxic hypoxia if there is respiratory pump is not working due to neuromuscular failure or whatever cause that is again hypoxic hypoxia if diffusion capacity of uh, gases through the lungs is reduced again that is hypoxic hypoxia is that right so hypoxic hypoxia is a hypoxia in which the real problem is that from the lungs oxygen could not be transferred properly to the blood right problem is in this sense 
then there is next cause of hypoxia and then next cause of hypoxia can be yes that is called anemic hypoxia hypoxia what is anemic hypoxia in which either hemoglobin level is less right either hemoglobin is absolutely deficient or it is dysfunctional because in carbon monoxide poisoning hemoglobin level total hemoglobin level may be normal but carbon monoxide makes a big percentage of hemoglobin dysfunctional which cannot carry oxygen or release oxygen properly so such type of problems in which hemoglobin is either deficient or dysfunctional and cannot transport oxygen and deliver oxygen properly we say there is what type of hypoxia anemic hypoxia right then there can be hypoxia due to problem with the either arterial blockage or due to venous obstruction right in which in a particular tissue circulation becomes stagnant right circulation becomes stagnant right now circulation can be stagnant in two ways either it be generalized stagnation in severe cardiac failure the circulation is very sluggish and slow because heart is not maintaining 5 liters of cardiac output per minute maybe heart is failing and producing only 1 liter of cardiac output per minute so generalized stagnation will occur or there may be some localized specific stagnation of circulatory system in a particular tissue either due to arterial blockage or due to reduced venous output right venous blockage either it is from lumen thrombosis blocking or it is compressed from outside some cancer is compressing or whatever right that may produce localized hypoxia right so this type of hypoxia which may be due to impaired yes impaired there's some dysfunction in circulatory system some dysfunction in circulatory system this type of hypoxia either which is due to congestive cardiac failure or which is due to some blockage of arterial system or blockage of venous system uh, because it produces some degree of sluggishness of circulation or stagnation in circulation so this is called stagnant hypoxia this is called stagnant hypoxia this is called stagnant hypoxia right in the end we are left with the last cause that we have brought the oxygen if successfully through all the system up to the tissue right oxygen has gone into the cells but if your enzymes are unable to utilize the oxygen right and that situation will be called what type of hypoxia yes histotoxic hypoxia what is that called histo toxic hypoxia these are the four basic types of hypoxia classically hypoxia is divided into four types this is hypoxic hypoxia in which oxygen supply to the pulmonary capillary blood is not proper or there is hemoglobin cannot transport that is anemic hypoxia or blood is properly oxygenized oxygenated hemoglobin is also having good amount of oxygen but circulation is poor either throughout the body or in some localized part of the body that is stagnant hypoxia and in the end if tissues are unable to utilize oxygen and that is called histotoxic hypoxia right now we will go into detail of hypoxic hypoxia first of all right to discuss that i'll make a small diagram rather on this diagram we will work before i really start discussing uh, let's talk about partial pressures of oxygen in the right heart in the alveoli in the alveolar capillaries and in the left heart and arterial side so you will tell me what is the partial pressure of oxygen 
right on the systemic veins okay partial pressure of oxygen in systemic veins yes please 40 millimeter of mercury that's good and of course then partial pressure of oxygen in the right atrium and right ventricle is the same 40 millimeter of mercury even in the pulmonary artery it is 40 millimeter of mercury right uh, what is the normal now we are talking about normal pressures then later on we will talk, talk, uh, talk about different pathologies what is the normal pressure of oxygen in alveolar space Partial pressure of uh, alveolar oxygen, we should say, is 100, about 104 millimeter of mercury, right? And as oxygen, as blood is passing through this area, of course, oxygen is adding, right, from alveoli. And it keep on adding from the alveoli, oxygen in a healthy person, it keep on adding until the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood become equal to the arterial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So what really happens, that blood which is leaving the lungs, it has how much partial pressure? Partial pressure of oxygen here is 100 millimeter of mercury. Is that right? And last time in last lecture I explained that uh, some blood which is coming back from bronchial circulation, right, that is not properly oxygenated, right? So the blood which is coming from the bronchial circulation and it adds to you can say this oxygenated blood but because this blood is you know the bronchial arteries and then bronchial capillaries this circulation is different than pulmonary circulation so bronchial arteries and bronchial capillaries uh, giving oxygen to the bronchial tissue right and uh, the conducting conducting part of the lungs and after that, bronchial veins are directly draining their blood into systemic circulation, uh, into arterialized blood, which is coming through pulmonary vein. And because this blood is not oxygenated, uh, you can say it is not properly oxygenated, so this small amount of blood, when it mixes with the oxygenated blood coming from the lungs, right, the total amount of blood which is coming here, due to this venous mixture, uh, partial pressure of oxygen little bit drop. So what really happens, partial pressure of oxygen in the systemic arterial side is how much? Right? Uh, usually it is written like this, partial pressure of arterial oxygen. Right? That is about 95 or 97. Whatever you call, 97, 95, both will be right. Am I clear? This is normal values. And we have to see in different causes of hypoxia what really happens. We'll talk one by one. Let's remove this number so that diagram become less messy. Now, let's start with atmospheric oxygen. That there is reduced oxygen in inspired air. Inspired air. Right? Now this may be due to high altitude. High altitude. But here you have to remember at high altitude it is not the reduced percentage of oxygen. It is the reduced partial pressure of oxygen because atmospheric ox uh, pressure is reduced. Right? When you go at very high altitude, of course, the total amount of oxygen coming in the alveolar is less and alveolar oxygen pressure goes down. I will discuss specifically now this thing. So what happens that in this patient, alveolar pressure will be down. Because alveolar pressure is down, but all other system is normal, so exchange will be normal. For example, in this particular patient, alveolar oxygen level is suppose 60. If alveolar oxygen level is not 100 but 60, but because exchange mechanisms are normal, so exchange will be, transfer will be good, so it will be now 60. And here what will happen? It may become 55. Is that right? Millimeter of mercury, of course, not percent, millimeter of mercury. Now, in this particular situation, what we really see, that partial pressure on the venous side is normal, 
right blood coming from right heart is normal but alveolar partial pressure is reduced then what is there yes on the pulmonary artery and left heart partial pressures are also reduced and partial pressure of oxygen on arterial side is also reduced is that clear but what about carbon dioxide and before i go into detail now partial pressure of alveolar oxygen minus partial pressure of uh, arterial oxygen do you think the difference of them is how much what is the normal difference first of all normally alveolar oxygen is 100 normally here it is about 95 normally so it means that normally there is a slight difference in alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and arterial partial pressure of oxygen normally this difference should not be more than suppose uh, how much 5 or 10 even normally it should not be uh, much difference between the alveolar oxygen and between arterial oxygen partial pressures in a healthy person is that right right now if i take from alveolar air oxygen in your lung it will be around 100 and i take arterial blood it must be around 95 so there is very little difference is that right now this uh, concept is important because later on we will talk about in some of the causes of hypoxia uh, this difference will become too much for example if this exchange area is poor then maybe here it is 100 and here it is 50 for example this uh, area is very fibrotic or exchange area is reduced then here may be good partial pressure but because uh, exchange is poor diffusion of gas is poor then uh, alveolar and arterial difference will become too much but in this type of uh, but in that type of hypoxia in which atmospheric oxygen is less alveolar pressure drops right as well as arterial pressure of oxygen also drops but they are not much different from each other so this gap is not increased this this point is clear this is number 1 that there is normal alveolar and arterial partial pressure of oxygen difference number 1 number 2 in this particular case what will happen to carbon dioxide let's suppose you go to a very high mountain the less oxygen going to the lungs air is very thin right alveolar pressure drop due to the dropped alveolar pressures less oxygen is oxygen is transferring defi, uh, efficiently but due to reduced pressure uh, pressure built up in arterial side is also reduced so partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial level is reduced alveolar and arterial partial pressure of oxygen are not much different is that right what about carbon dioxide level in these patients carbon dioxide level will it will increase or decrease look now here i think you need a concept in some types of hypoxia with reduced oxygen there is increased carbon dioxide level and in some other types of hypoxia there is reduced oxygen as well as reduced carbon dioxide so it is not must that carbon dioxide should always go down with the oxygen in this example it will not let me explain how in this case when you are at a very high altitude right you are your body is receiving less oxygen uh, then you will hypoventilate or hyperventilate to compensate you will hyperventilate when you will hyperventilate oxygen carbon dioxide will be efficiently transferred is that right because remember write it down somewhere whenever you hyperventilate you wash out carbon dioxide from body why because when you are hyperventilating you are mixing your alveolar air very efficiently with the fresh air fresh air has extremely low level of carbon dioxide is that right normally what is the carbon dioxide constant uh, pressure here carbon dioxide partial pressure here 46 what is the partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide here normally 40 40 so carbon dioxide comes here with pressure of 46 and because pressure here is 40 normally so 6 unit of carbon dioxide uh, some of the carbon dioxide is transferred there and carbon dioxide normally here is 40 this is normal carbon dioxide transport mechanism someone who has not watched the videos of oxygen transport and carbon dioxide transport you have to watch that to understand it more clearly anyway let's come back so what i'm talking about 
that normally the partial pressure of carbon dioxide which is maintained in alveoli is around 40. But partial pressure of carbon dioxide outside is very, very low in atmospheric air. If you hyperventilating, it means you are taking excessive fresh air and exchanging with the alveolar air. So from the alveoli, carbon dioxide will be washed away. And when there will be dramatic fall in alveolar carbon dioxide level, of course carbon dioxide will more efficiently shift there and arterial carbon dioxide level will drop. Are you understanding it? So all those hypoxias which are associated with hyperventilation, there will be carbon dioxide washout. Especially this example, that when you are at a high altitude, you are having less oxygen supply. To catch up your oxygen supply, you hyperventilate and you do get some oxygen extra, but you really wash out your carbon dioxide. That is why at high altitude, when you wash out the carbon dioxide, you know some of the carbon dioxide in the blood is mixing with water. And that is making what? Carbonic? Is said, thank you for knowing it. Now, what really happens? When you hyperventilate, you wash out carbon dioxide. And when you wash out carbon dioxide, then of course, in the body, less carbon dioxide is available to make carbonic acid. So it is practically washing out carbonic acid. Right? So actually, it's when you are washing out carbon dioxide, you are washing out from the blood and fluids, carbonic acid so actually you are producing deficiency of acidic material or you are producing alkalosis that is how high altitude produces alkalosis am i clear again all the mechanisms of hypoxia will talk about what happens to alveolar level of oxygen what happens to arterial level of oxygen and what happens to carbon dioxide and what is the response of this hypoxia to the supplemental oxygen. These are the four parameters you have to discuss about every hypoxia. Again, what are these four parameters? Let's write them somewhere. Number one, you have to talk about what happens to in, in a patient with hypoxia, what is happening to partial pressure of alveolar oxygen. Number two, you have to talk about what is partial pressure of it, arterial oxygen. Right? Number three, you have to talk about what is happening to partial pressure of carbon dioxide on arterial side, especially. And then you have to talk about what is the response of patient right to towards supplemental supplemental oxygen. Because I will explain this concept that in some type of hypoxia, giving extra oxygen really makes the situation better. And there are some other types of hypoxias in which giving extra oxygen does not raise the oxygen level in arterial side. And you are becoming doctors, you must know the differences in these types of hypoxia. So is that clear about the atmospheric that alveolar level will go down as far as oxygen is concerned, arterial level of oxygen will go down and carbon dioxide level in the blood will also go up or down? Down. Is that right? Now we come to some other cause. I think it has been discussed too much. High altitude or inspired oxygen less in gas mixtures, when especially in anesthesias. Is that right? Anesthetic gases when you are given. Now we come to the next cause of hypoxia. Let's suppose next cause is of hypoxic hypoxia is problem is here. That there is, yeah, obstruction in the airways. Such diseases are called as a group COPDs or COADs. COPDs, chronic obstructive airway diseases. Uh, pulmonary, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases or chronic obstructive airway diseases. That is same. Uh, there are many diseases in this group. Classically, it is uh, its classical member of this group is asthma. Now see what happens in asthma, what type of, what is the mechanism of hypoxia and what happens to those four parameters. Let's suppose I develop asthma. What is asthma? Bronchoconstriction. For example, my one bronchi uh, bronchial small here constrict, I'm having asthma. What is asthma? It is generalized tendency for bronchoconstriction. Rather, look. If just one or two bronchioles constrict, this is not asthma. There should be tendency for the 
generalized construction of bronchioles right it may be due to allergy or it may be due to some inflammatory process i will not discuss now the pathogenesis i will just talk about that when multiple bronchioles are constructed what happens to those four parameters let's suppose multiple bronchioles are constructed it means now gas exchange between the alveoli and the atmosphere is increased or decreased this is decreased there is obstruction to generalize obstruction to the airways right it happens for example in uh, asthma so what really happens with the patient that because of at multiple levels a uh, multiple bronchioles are semi constructed obstructed or constructed right during inspiration patient does not take enough oxygen to the alveoli and during expiration he cannot bring enough gases out so actually it is an example of reduced ventilation this is an example of reduced ventilation right so we can say patient with copd here we have taken example of asthma right this is an example of hypo ventilation now this needs to be underlined because in uh, example in previous case there was no hypo ventilation but here there is hypo ventilation now remember whenever there is hypoventilation means what the whatever the mechanism in hypoventilation this is reduced exchange of alveolar gases with the atmospheric gases is that right when there is reduced exchanges it means what will happen here that less fresh oxygen coming right because oxygen supply is coming less during hypoventilation whatever oxygen is here it is going to the blood so gradually alveolar pressure of oxygen will drop in this patient in patient with asthma what really happens that partial pressure of alveolar oxygen drops let's suppose it become 50 this is one problem but do you think gas exchange is okay yes it is okay so whatever low oxygen is available it can transfer right so even though because alveolar oxygen was less eventually you can say oxygen on arterial side tension of oxygen on arterial side will be also less but because exchanges are okay so do you think there will be much difference between the alveolar oxygen tension and arterial oxygen tension no we are understanding this point so in patient with copd like asthma right there is hypoventilation due to hypoventilation the alveolar oxygen pressures drop and due to reduced alveolar pressures of oxygen there is reduced uh, you can say build up of arterial pressure of oxygen is that right so what happens that in this patient point number 1 we are going to talk about those four parameters point number 1 that partial alveolar oxygen pressures drop is that right then partial arterial oxygen pressures also drop but partial alveolar oxygen minus partial arterial oxygen is normal that's good and if you give oxygen what will happen if you give supplemental oxygen yani extra uh, you give oxygen normally oxygen in the air is about 21% let's suppose you start giving it 40% right extra oxygen right if you give extra oxygen what will happen to this person okay we'll talk that later before that another important point i have to talk very important what happens to carbon dioxide in this hypoventilating patient carbon dioxide will increase because he is not mixing the alveolar gas with the external air so carbon dioxide which is coming is accumulating here and because carbon dioxide is accumulating here so alveolar carbon dioxide level go up and when alveolar carbon dioxide level go up in hypoventilating patient then naturally carbon dioxide cannot efficiently shift from blood to the alveoli so on the arterial side or even on the venous side uh, what happens carbon dioxide level increase there is increase partial pressure of carbon dioxide now i put a big star with it so very important point do you think it's good for patient or bad yeah. in one way it is good 
because this carbon dioxide will irritate respiratory neurons. You know, carbon dioxide can cross the blood-brain barrier and in the brain it will, with water, carbonic acid and then dissociate into protons and bicarb and proton is a very powerful stimulant for inspiratory center. So actually in asthma, breathing is very difficult because your airways are semi-closed. You have to breathe against uh, resistance and you become tired, upset, anguished. But thank God, this carbon dioxide which is retained to some degree, of course, too much carbon dioxide is bad, but little extra carbon dioxide helps to stimulate your, what? Inspiratory, inspiratory systems. So that respiratory drive is maintained by special extra effort of retained carbon dioxide. Am I clear? There is no problem? Is that right? Now, then in these patients, if you give them oxygen, what will happen? If you give them extra oxygen, even though they are ventilating less because their airways are blocked, rather than every minute, normal person is taking, let's suppose, minute ventilation is 6 liter, they were doing, let's suppose, only 2 liter. But if you give extra oxygen in those 2 liters, then what will happen? Alveolar level of oxygen will go up and arterial level of oxygen will also go up. So, there is a good response to supplemental oxygen. Now, actually we say there is okay, good response to supplemental, oxygen supplemental situation. Even in this also, there is good response to supplemental oxygen, when oxygen was less in the air. Is that right? No problem up to this? Now, what we learned up to now in this example, that whenever there is hypoventilation, oxygen tension in the blood will go down, but carbon dioxide tension in the blood will go up and, and response to oxygen is good. Supplemental oxygen response is good. Now we come to another example. In this case, what happens to ventilation perfusion ratios? In this asthma case, Normally, ventilation perfusion ratio is 0.8. Normal ventilation perfusion ratio is 0.8. But in these patients, ventilation is more or less. When bronchioles are semi-constricted, ventilation is more or less. Less. So, actually in these patients, ventilation becomes less. And if cardiac output is normal, it means that total ventilation perfusion ratio will Yes, drop. In these patients, ventilation perfusion ratio will drop. Right? For example, if your uh, ventilation is reduced 50% and cardiac output is normal, natu naturally it means ventilation perfusion ratio is drop. So, any patient, he has dropped ventilation perfusion ratio, right? Probably it means air coming to the alveoli is less. But with that, he is retaining carbon dioxide also. Not only oxygen is low, he is retaining carbon dioxide also. So, it means their cause is hypoventilation. Now, we come to another situation. Let's suppose someone has pump failure, respiratory pump failure. Respiratory pump failure. Now, I will remove these things. We we'll go to another cause of hypoxia. Respiratory pump failure means that either respiratory pump means neuromuscular operators, right, which is responsible for inspiration and expiration, so that alveolar uh, air should be exchanged with the atmospheric air. Is that right? Now, if someone has respiratory pump impairment, what could be the causes? I told you previously either medullary depression or there may be demyelination or dysfunctional N neurons or nerves like phrenic nerves or intercostal nerves, a problem with the neuromuscular junction, we have already talked about myasthenia gravis. So, all these problems, right, they also produce hypoventilation because if uh, neuromuscular operators is not working well, do you think you can inspire properly? You can take proper inspiration? So, what will happen? That total exchange of 
alveolar air with the atmospheric air is increased or decreased? You are not understanding me. I think all of you need a break now. I will give, but first you complete this area. Listen. Uh, if suppose my medulla is depressed, or my neurons like phrenic nerves, what is the root value of phrenic nerve? C345. That's good. Right? C345. Phrenic nerve, intercostal nerves, they are demyelinated, or neuromuscular junction due to myasthenia gravis are not working well, or you have given some drug like uh, during anesthesia, we give drugs which are muscle relaxant. All these mechanisms reduce the inspiratory capabilities produced by the respiratory pump. So this person cannot ins uh, produce normal number of inspiration per minute and cannot produce normal depths of inspiration every minute. So ventilation will reduce. So this is another example of hypoventilation. So hypoventilation may be either airways are blocked, patient could not ventilate or neuromuscular apparatus is not working, patient would not ventilate. Again, there are some situations patient would not ventilate. There are some situations patient operators is trying to ventilate but could not ventilate. Would not, venti uh, would not ventilate is situation when neuromuscular pump fail. And could not ventilate when pump is working hard but airways are obstructed. Is that right? Both situations lead to hypoventilation. So problems here or here or problems with the muscles or diaphragm, all these lead to hypo ventilation. Now the remaining thing should be easy. If a person is hypoventilating, oxygen level here will drop because exchange is still okay. So oxygen level in arterial blood will also drop but alveolar and arterial oxygen tensions will not be much different. Is that right? And because patient is hypoventilating, carbon dioxide level will go up. So rapidly now you will tell me. In respiratory pump failure, Partial pressure of alveolar oxygen will go up or down? Down. Uh, partial pressure of arterial oxygen will go down. And partial pressure of alveolar oxygen minus partial pressure of arterial oxygen, uh, this will be wide difference or normal difference? Normal. And partial pressure of carbon dioxide will go up. So this is another example of hypoventilation. Is that right? And in this hypoventilatory patients, Tell me, if you give extra supplemental oxygen, will there be any response or not? There will be. Okay, I'm not talking about dead patients. <laughs> All right, I'm talking about hypoventilating patient. Hypoventilation means that patient is ventilating less than normal. Is that right? Uh, let's suppose rather than taking 6 liters of air in and out, he's taking only 3 liters of air. In 6 liters of air, he was taking inspired oxygen 21%. And 6 liter, right now you are taking 6 liter air in and out from your lungs every minute. And percentage of oxygen which is going in is, from atmosphere is 21%. Is that right? Let's suppose you hyperventilate because your, your neuromuscular junction is impaired due to myasthenia gravis. I'm not talking about respiratory arrest, no. I'm talking about just reduced function. So your ventilation reduced from 6 to 3 liter per minute. If you put in the oxygen supply, rather than 21, you make it 42 or 50% oxygen, do you think benefit will go to you or not? Yes. You will be benefited because even though you are taking less, ox uh, less air in and out, but whatever air you bring in, right, you are bringing extra amount of oxygen in that. You are understanding me? It is just like that, that every month you are getting one check of one dollar. Very sad. Right? You are getting one check of one dollar every month or you get hypoventilation of checks, not getting every month, you get every six months, but you get six dollars. So it is okay. So in the same way, what really happens that even though in hypoventilating situations, either due to chronic obstructive airways or hypoventilating situations due to respiratory pump failures, right, uh, even though alveolar oxygen level is low, but if you give extra oxygen by intranasal cannoli or you give oxygen through mask, right? Uh, if you give extra oxygen, that extra oxygen will raise the alveolar oxygen level. And naturally, if alveolar oxygen tension will go up, 
then more oxygen will be transferred and patient will there will be significant elevation in arterial level of oxygen am i clear so again we should make a happy face here that as in copd supplemental oxygen is good in inspired air if oxygen is less it is good even in respiratory pump impairment not complete failure if you give oxygen it is good is that right let's have a break then we'll continue So we were talking about the mechanisms of hypoxia and response to oxygen. First of all, we discussed that if there is less oxygen, partial pressure or less percentage of oxygen in the inspired air, right, then supplemental oxygen is good, right. Then we were talking about in patient of COPD, right, they are hypoventilating, oxygen is good. But there is something very important that when we give oxygen to them, we have to be very, very careful. Why? Because in COPD patients, patients who are having chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, right, they are chronically hypoventilating. Due to that reason, they are having hypoxemia plus hypercapnia. Low oxygen is called hypoxemia and chronically and high level of carbon dioxide in the blood is called hypercapnia. These patients of COPD have chronically low oxygen and high carbon dioxide in the blood. Now, all of you must be knowing that normally carbon dioxide is a strong stimulant to respiratory system. Normally carbon dioxide is a strong stimulant to respiratory system. But if some patient is chronically hypoventilating, then carbon dioxide sensitivity of neurons to carbon dioxide drive is lost. Listen again. If someone has chronic pulmonary obstructive disease, Patient has chronically hypoxemia and hypercapnia. In acute situation, hypercapnia is a very good driver of inspiratory center. But if you have prolonged hypercapnia, then inspiratory centers become insensitive to the raised carbon dioxide. Right? So it means in patient with COPD, hypercapnia is not the real driver of inspiratory center. So, inspiratory centers in patient on COPD are responding only to hypoxemia. Is that right? So, inspiratory drive in patient with COPD is not hypercapnia, but it is only hypoxemia. And if you really give good concentration of oxygen, you simply eliminate the hypoxemia, actually you eliminate the driver to inspiratory center and patient may go into respiratory arrest. Is that right? That is why in patient with chronic obstructive airway diseases, you have to be very careful when you give oxygen, right? Usually we give oxygen in a very severe asthma of that type, which is of acute onset. For example, there are people who have asthma intermittently, once in a six month attack. Right? So if someone from last six months was not having asthma and now today morning he had a very severe attack due to exposure to a particular allergen, in that case you can give oxygen. Is that right? Now let's come back. Yes? I, I don't get it. You, you can't understand. Or what thing you couldn't understand? Um, why is it... Uh... Why it's important to be careful when you give oxygen to a patient with COPD? Yes. Okay, let me repeat it again. Look, this is inspiratory neurons. Is that right? Inspiratory neurons are the real driver of the inspiratory effort or ventilatory effort. Clear? Now, these neurons are very, very sensitive to protons. Is that right? Any patient who has chronic obstructive airway disease, chronic means for long time, not episodic, right? If someone is chronically obstructed, it means chronically exchange of alveolar air with atmospheric air is less due to this obstruction. It means patient is chronically hypoventilating. If patient is chronically hypoventilating, there will be two results. Number one, there will be less oxygen here and less oxygen in the blood. That is hypoxemia. Number two, there will be increased carbon dioxide accumulation here because carbon dioxide is not being exchanged with the fresh air. Right? And there will be increased carbon dioxide level in the blood. 
So these patients who are chronically having hypoventilation, they develop low level of oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen, which is called hypoxemia and chronically elevated level of carbon dioxide in the blood, which is called hypercapnia. Is that right? Now, actually respiratory centers are more sensitive to the elevated carbon dioxide than to the low oxygen. Statement number one, right? In acute phases, respiratory centers or inspiratory centers are more sensitive to carbon dioxide than to oxygen. Is that right? Now, actually they are not really sensitive to carbon dioxide. Basically, carbon dioxide crosses the blood-brain barrier and bind with the water, make carbonic acid which dissociate into bicarb and protons. Actually, inspiratory neurons are extremely sensitive to protons. And of course, whenever there is more carbon dioxide going to CNS, more protons are generated there and inspiratory efforts become more. Is that right? But the problem is, if someone has chronically elevated carbon dioxide level in the blood, then inspiratory center become des desensitized, less sensitive to the carbon dioxide drive. So what does it mean? That, listen, that in acute elevation of carbon dioxide in the blood, hypercapnia is the wonderful driver of inspiratory center. Hypercapnia can drive the inspiratory center only for a short time. If there is chronically there is elevated carbon dioxide, then inspiratory center becomes resistant to the stimulation by the carbon dioxide. So hypercapnia remains there, but it is no more in chronic cases a drive, real driver of the inspiratory neurons. Claro? No. So what is driving? You know, patients who have asthma, they still are doing inspiratory effort. So in the long run, it is not retained carbon dioxide which drives those inspiratory efforts. Those inspiratory efforts are basically maintained by hypoxemia. That is the low level of oxygen in the blood. Is that right? Because inspiratory systems do not develop desensitization to hypoxic drive. They do develop desensitization to hypercapnic drive. Am I clear? So, what really drives inspiratory center in a patient with COPD is hypoxia. Now, if you give him a very good supply of oxygen, you basically eliminate hypoxia. And as soon as you eliminate hypoxia, respiratory, inspiratory neurons were used to work with hypoxia driven situation. You eliminate hypoxia, you eliminate the drive for neurons. Is that right? And there is respiratory arrest. Am I clear? No problem? Okay, let's move forward. Respiratory pump failure we discussed. Again, there's hypoventilation and supply of... Yes, you have one more question? Yeah, but why is it that oxygen becomes toxic sometimes when you, like, when you give pure oxygen to the patient with COPD, they say that they might kill the patient. Why, why is that? Uh, she is asking a question that uh, when there is somewhere she has uh, read or heard that in COPD patient if you give oxygen you will kill the patient. Again I will repeat that in COPD patient the real driver of uh, inspiratory centers are hypoxia. When you give the oxygen actually oxygen simply eliminates the hypoxia which was the real driver of those inspiratory neurons and neurons are no more driven, no more stimulated and they block their activity and that leads to respiratory arrest. Is that right? Then the concept of oxygen toxicity is a different thing. We'll discuss sometimes else that if uh, someone is given 100% pure oxygen for a long time, it produces complications, right? Especially in the infant, they produce uh, retro lenticular hypo... Yeah. Pardon? Retro? Oh no, not erythroblastosis vitalis. It means you should know what is erythroblastosis vitalis. Actually, retro lenticular fibro hypoplasia. We'll talk about that somewhere else, not now. Let's concentrate on more causes of hypoxia, right? Okay, now after that, we come to another interesting and sad situation of hypoxia. Now listen. Now the mechanism of hypoxic hypoxia, which I'm going to explain, you should listen very carefully. And if you don't understand, ask me immediately. It's worth understanding. 
Actually, the type of hypoxia which I'm going to explain now, it does not significantly respond to oxygen. Why? What's wrong there? <laughs> Actually, let me make a lung here. Let's suppose this is your airway. Oh my God, spinal cord come in here. This is one and this is the other part. Now you know, let's suppose from here, this is your blood supply and this is another blood supply from this area. Naturally, they come together here. This is input of, um, input of blood and here is also input of blood. Okay, we can make it to this alveolar system. Now what we do, that let's suppose there is no air coming to this pocket. Due to some reason, there is no ventilation here, there is zero ventilation here. What could be that some reason? One classical example is that this part of the lung collapses. Sometimes what happens, some part of the lungs collapse totally. If they totally collapse, do you think then air can go into that collapsed alveoli? No. So whenever there is collapse of lung, okay, I will write it here, that what could be the causes of no ventilation or dangerously reduced ventilation. One cause of reduced ventilation is collapsed lung. Collapsed. It may be complete lung collapse or a part of a lung collapsed. When a part of a lung or a complete lung collapses, the condition is called atelectasis. Condition is called atelectasis. Now in atelectasis, what could be the causes of atelectasis? Maybe there is some obstruction here. If there is some complete obstruction here, then no air can go in and out. And whatever air is here, it will be absorbed and then it will collapse. Right? Or, so one is the airway obstruction, one cause. Other cause of atelectasis may be that there is some external pressure on this part of the lung. Sometimes there is external pressure on a part of lung. Let me explain how it happens. Let's suppose this is your lung and here is, uh, what is this? Yes, please. Pleura. Pleura right? Mm, and of course, you are intelligent enough to understand what are these things? Ribs with your intercostal chest wall, I mean. Right? Now listen. Sometimes it happens that normally uh, parietal pleura and visceral pleura are sticky to each other. And this space is not truly there. It is potential space, but not a true space. There is very little fluid. Due to that, both layers are sticky. If due to some reason, some pathological substance accumulate here. What could be this substance? Maybe entry of air there? Or there may be entry of uh, serous fluid there? Some fluid there? Or there may be accumulation of pus there? Or there may be some lymphatic fluid accumulated there? So what will happen? When fluid accumulates here, the two layers are no more sticky. Right? For example, if air accumulates here, we say there is pneumothorax. If serous fluid accumulates there, then we call it hydrothorax. If pus accumulates here, we call it pyothorax. And if uh, lymphatic fluid accumulates here, we call it chylothorax. So whatever accumulate in this pleural space, pl uh, what really happens, now visceral pleura is no more sticky to parietal pleura. And they fall away from each other. Under this process, it is quite possible that it becomes like this, right? This part of the lung is now compressed and this is all that fluid accumulated here. Is that right? Now this part of the lung, now you can see that from here, this is all air pockets, but here the air pockets are atelectatic. Right? Now, do you think in these air pockets any air will be coming? No, this is collapsed part of the lung, atelectatic part of the lung. But blood will be passing through. Now you imagine that either collapse, atelectasis occur due to airway obstruction or maybe due to expansion of pleural potential space, which may be pneumothorax or pneumothorax or 
काइलोथोरैक्स और हाइड्रोथोरैक्स वट एवर राइट और देर इज एनदर रीजन नाउ एयर वे ऑब्सट्रक्शन नो वेंटिलेशन न्यूमोथोरैक्स और काइलोथोरैक्स हाइड्रोथोरैक्स इवन हीमोथोरैक्स इफ ब्लड इज एक्यूमुलेटेड हियर दैट विल लीड टू कंप्रेशन ऑफ दिस पार्ट एंड अगेन नो एयर और थर्ड मैकेनिज्म इन विच देर इज नो वेंटिलेशन इज दैट समाइम्स हैव यू हर्ड ऑफ पलमोनरी अडीमा ओके शी हैज हर्ड ऑफ इट गुड सो पलमोनरी अडीमा समटाइम्स बिकम सो सवेयर दैट फ्लूड एक्यूमुलेट इन अलव्यूलर स्पेसिस एंड एयर इज डिसप्लेस्ड डू यू थिंक in those alveoli which are filled with the edematous fluid do you think those alveoli will undergo ventilatory process ventilation will occur there no so what really happens in very very severe very very severe pulmonary edema for example if i have a very very severe pulmonary edema and i'm standing edema will be more worse in lower pa basal part of lungs and it may even totally block the sum of the alveoli with the fluid and no air is going there so it means that area become extremely hypoventilated or zero ventilation or have you heard of a disease called pneumonia pneumonia what happens in pneumonia pneumonia is a inflammation of lung parenchyma in which sometimes there is so much exudation of fluid that that fluid inflammatory fluid comes into what is this alveoli and completely alveoli become full of pus or full of inflammatory exudate again under these circumstances if my this part of the lung is developing a pneumonic patch right it means here is pneumonia and lot of infection and during that infection there is inflammation and pulmonary capillaries bring lot of white cells and protein rich fluid and that accumulate into alveoli and if all the alveolar air is replaced by uh, inflammatory fluid do you think ventilation will be there into those pneumonic patches do you think air will be passing through pneumonic patches no so what really happens all these are examples that either due to airway obstruction it collapses and no ventilation or due to external pressure from here right some part of the lung collapses and no ventilation or uh, some of the alveoli become full of fluid in pulmonary edema or in pneumonic patch with inflammatory fluid no ventilation if there is zero ventilation here now whatever blood will come here do you think this blood will have any exchange of its gases no so this blood will go out right without any change in its chemical composition that this blood at the end of the capillary will have partial pressure of oxygen still 40 and partial pressure of carbon dioxide still 46 in this person but this is the other alveolus now air which was supposed to go here this air will be diverted to the other alveoli this second alveoli is over ventilated right and first was under ventilated or we should say zero zero ventilated now which is over ventilated even if partial pressure of oxygen here becomes slightly more extra ox partial pressure of oxygen cannot load the oxygen further because normally oxygen is loaded up to 100% saturation so extra pressure of oxygen in this area may slightly increase the dissolved oxygen it means that hyperventilated alveoli cannot compensate for the loss of gas exchange in this area is that right now here the blood in a way we can say this blood which is passing through this zero ventilated alveolar area this blood is said to be shunted through the lungs without any gases exchange this is called what is this phenomenon called shunt simply right so we can say that another mechanism of hypoxia is shunting shunting may be intrapulmonary right or shunting of the blood may occur intracardiac extrapulmonary let me tell you how listen now we come to this example 
that if this is collapsed or this is full of fluid, no gas exchange occur. So whatever blood is passing through this vascular bed, this is in a way shunting through the lung without any exchange of gases. So naturally this blood, this blood will mix with the other blood, right? But after the mixture, total level of arterial oxygen will go down. That is the problem. You are not understanding it. Oh, you thought shunt was a block. This is not true. No problem. It happens. Sometimes we learn the things. No problem. Don't worry. Right now you have to think shunt is a situation in which blood from the right side, right side, just a minute. Uh, shunting means that blood is moving through a part of lung without any gas exchange. That's a simple definition. Blood is moving from the right heart to the left heart through some part of the lung without any gaseous exchange. Why there is no gas exchange? Probably there is fibro, uh, probably there is atelectasis, collapse of lung, no air. Blood is passing but air is not there. Or alveoli are not collapsed but full of fluids or pus, pneumonia. And again blood is passing and no air. So whenever blood passes through some part of the lung without any gaseous exchange, it is practically blood has shunted the gas exchange area. Because primary purpose of the lung is provide gas exchange. If blood passes through the lung without any exchange, it means it has bypassed it or shunted it. Am I clear? So many diseases develop these shunts. Is that right? Pneumonia can develop these shunts. Hydrothorax, pneumothorax, hemothorax, chylothorax, pyothorax, they can develop shunts, is that right? Or any other cause of lung collapse can produce shunt. Extremely severe pulmonary edema can produce shunt. Now why it is important to understand shunt, I will tell you. Look, blood from here is being shunted, blood from here is normally oxygenated. But when both sides blood will go to the left heart and to the arterial side, total blood arterial oxygen tension will go down. Because this blood is mixing with the well oxygenated blood. This less oxygenated blood is mixing with the well oxygenated blood and bringing the arterial level of oxygen down. So in this patient, what we will see, number one, partial pressure of oxygen in alveoli. Now actually, that will be measured in these healthy alveoli. So that may be normal. Partial pressure of oxygen in alveolar oxygen will be normal because what we do that we will measure the alveolar oxygen in those alveoli which are not collapsed. Is that right? So we will think it is normal. Is that right? But when we will measure the partial pressure of arterial oxygen that will be low. For example, alveolar oxygen is still 100 and this may be 50. Am I clear? Then we come to the next thing, third factor, the carbon dioxide. What will happen to carbon dioxide in these patients? Because carbon dioxide has also not exchanged, so more carbon dioxide coming to the blood and carbon dioxide level will go up. Is that right? So increased carbon dioxide level. But if this patient hyperventilates, then he may wash out carbon dioxide from healthy areas. Is that right? If a patient with pneumonia hyperventilates, right, this hyperventilation may help the patient to wash out carbon dioxide from other areas. But from other areas, he cannot get extra oxygen to compensate for the oxygen loss. Are you understanding? Then, al alveolar oxygen minus arterial oxygen, this difference will be high or low? Alveolar oxygen was normal because we measure from the normal. And arterial oxygen is down because some blood is coming through shunt which is not oxygenated and mixing it. So alveolar oxygen will be high and arterial oxygen tension will be low. So there will be increased difference in alveolar and arterial oxygen tension. Is it clear? Sure. Now, what you will do in this patient? Let's suppose you try oxygen. Now you have to answer, not me. Right? In this patient, 
where the shunt has been developed because some part of the lung is either completely collapsed or air spaces are replaced by fluids. Is that right? In this patient, you give extra oxygen, supplemental oxygen. The supplemental oxygen go to the atelectric area or shunted area or it will go to the remaining healthy area. area. Now this supplemental oxygen, when it will go to the healthy area, do you think there it will significantly increase oxygen shifting to the blood? No. no. And supplemental oxygen will not go in that area where there is real problem. So do you think in this patient who has low oxygen level in the blood and alveolar oxygen tension and arterial oxygen tension difference is too much, when you give him supplemental oxygen, do you think this supplemental oxygen will correct the hypoxemia significantly? No. no. Because supplemental oxygen is not able to go into those alveoli which are responsible for shunting phenomenon. Is that right? So here we say giving the supplemental oxygen is not useful. Is that right? Or uh, another clinical saying is that if a patient has severe hypoxemia, how do you define hypoxemia? When arterial oxygen tension is less than 80 millimeter of mercury. This is the definition of hypoxemia. What is hypoxemia? There is a difference in hypoxia and hypoxemia. Hypoxemia means partial pressure of oxygen is less in the blood. Hypoxia means supply of oxygen to the tissue and utility of oxygen is less. So hypoxemia is said to be there whenever there is uh, less than 80 millimeter of mercury partial pressure of oxygen on the arterial side. Right? Now listen. If I am having right now arterial of course hypoxemia alveolar gas level uh, alveolar oxygen tension is high and arterial oxygen tension is low right and my real problem is suppose half of the right lung has developed pneumonia and no air is going to the half of my right lung is that right you give me supplemental oxygen can it significantly raise my oxygen level no. or my or suppose my half of my right lung is collapsed and you give me supplemental oxygen which is going to the area which is not collapsed. Do you think that will elevate the arterial blood oxygen significantly? No. So, the concept is this, or clinical saying is this, when a patient comes with severe hypoxemia with big difference in alveolar and arterial oxygen difference, right, and you give supplemental oxygen and there is no elevation of oxygen, most probable cause of hypoxemia is shunting through the lung or shunting somewhere else. Shunting can occur somewhere else also, right? In the heart. For example, listen, I just draw a very simple heart. Due to any reason, for example, you have ventricular septal defect. If patient has ventricular septal defect, blood shunt from, this is left side, this is right side. Blood moves initially from left to right or right to left. Initially, it moves left to right because left ventricle produces a higher pressure than the right. And I think you must know, blood moves from high pressure to low pressure. So when a newborn is, a new baby is, uh, there is a newborn with ventricular septal defect, actually blood shunts from left to right. Is that right? But actually what happens, when blood is more and more coming to the right side, oxygenated blood is mixing with the deoxygenated blood, Right? There is no problem with the ox uh, arterial oxygen level. And this blood plus the blood which is coming new, you know, from venous side, both of them will go to the lungs. Should I make full diagram or you are understanding it? Right? So this shunted blood left to right plus this blood which is venous return, both of them go to the lung. And blood, uh, pulmonary blood flow becomes more and in the pulmonary flow whatever blood is going to pulmonary system that is having additional oxygen due to this shunted blood left to right clear actually eventually it lead to pulmonary hypertension right and when pulmonary hypertension develops right ventricle start hypertrophy until it becomes so strong that shunt is reversed that is called Eisenmenger syndrome you will study it later. But for a while you just understand that shunt will eventually reverse due to right ventricular hypertrophy. 
when shunt reverses then deoxygenated blood from the venous side is mixing to the arterial side then arterial partial pressure of oxygen will drop then arterial oxygen pressure will drop are you understanding now of course you just do an echocardiography if heart is normal it must be in the okay, I, <laughs> I will teach you in step 2 preparation clinical side right but for a while you trust me what I'm saying <laughs> right so what really happens that what I wanted to tell you there are two types of shunts your blood is shunted through the lungs without oxygenation and gas exchange or blood is shunted from right side of the heart to the left right in both cases blood is going from the venous side to the arterial side without any oxygenation so arterial oxygen level will go down, down. now in these patient if you give extra oxygen can you elevate the oxygen level in the arterial side significantly no so this was a very important point to remember in whole today's lecture that if a patient come with hypoxemia and you are giving oxygen and you are unable to elevate you can say oxygen level in the significantly oxygen level in the arterial side one of the important causes shunting of the blood either through the pulmonary system or through the cardiac system or even through the great vessels right anyway so this shunting right you have to treat the underlying cause to correct the hypoxemia for example pneumonia should be treated with antibiotics naturally when inflammation will finish fluid from alveoli will be absorbed right alveoli will become again aerated and problem will be solved now in this area what was ventilation perfusion problem here ventilation by perfusion is equal to normally should be 0.8 but here there was no ventilation so zero ventilation but lot of perfusion so there is dangerous drop in ventilation perfusion ratio so whenever there is dangerous drop in whenever in some part of the lung there is dangerous drop in ventilation perfusion ratio it means you are developing shunts and more and more you develop shunts in a disease process more uh, more your arterial hypoxemia become resistant to oxy supplemental oxygen could you understand this statement okay thank you for understanding it now we move forward and now there is very little left because other causes I will just discuss briefly we were discussing respiration so this part needed big explanation now anemic hypoxia it's easy to understand if someone has very severe anemia normally a person has 15 gram hemoglobin per 100 ml or per dl let's suppose your hemoglobin is only 5 grams per 100 ml if your level of hemoglobin is very very low right uh, what will happen to in this case now we talk about a patient whose hemoglobin level is very low what will happen uh, he will have of course total first we we'll start here what will happen to alveolar oxygen level normal what will happen to partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial side it will be normal I think you have to see the video of oxygen transport that actually the oxygen is shifted from here first it get dissolved and dissolved oxygen is responsible for partial pressure then oxygen shift to the hemoglobin is that right so what really happens when hemoglobin levels go dangerously down patient is severely anemic then dissolved oxygen level in the plasma remain normal so partial pressure of oxygen in the plasma remain normal but total amount of oxygen which is delivered to the tissue is dangerously reduced uh, are you understanding me because oxygen is transported in the blood in two form in dissolved form and in complex with hemoglobin when hemoglobin level is low then dissolved level of oxygen is normal so partial pressure of oxygen is normal but still there is hypoxia to the tissue because definition of hypoxia is reduce supply of oxygen to the tissue but this will not be called hypoxemia because partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is normal definition of hypoxemia was when in the arterial blood partial pressure of oxygen is less than 80 millimeter of mercury when hemoglobin is low 
but dissolved oxygen is normal this is the dissolved oxygen which maintains partial pressure so this patient will have severe hypoxia but not hypoxemia is that right all other patients up to this they were having hypoxemia and hypoxia right but this patient who is anemic patient he does not have hypoxemia but he does have hypoxia is that right i think no need to further explain another thing which is important relevant to this anemic hypoxia or some people simply call it carbon carbon monoxide intoxication actually if someone develops significant carbon monoxide intoxication then what really happens that even if that person has normal concentration of hemoglobin but that amount of hemoglobin which is complex with carbon monoxide that hemoglobin is not available for oxygen transport is that right so in a way uh, if i get carbon monoxide poisoning then the hemoglobin which is complex with carbon monoxide that is called carboxyhemoglobin carboxyhemoglobin is functionally deleted from my system so functional hemoglobin truly become less this is one problem second problem is that in case of carbon monoxide poisoning you must be remembering that oxygen association dissociation curve shift to the left it means whatever hemoglobin is left there without carbon monoxide even that hemoglobin does not transfer the oxygen to the tissues readily so tissues will develop hypoxia is it right again suppose in a hemoglobin molecule every hemoglobin molecule is tetramer two monomers are having oxygen and two of them are having this naughty carbon monoxide now this part of hemoglobin is deleted so in a way there is deficiency of functional hemoglobin even though total hemoglobin concentration is normal but in this hemoglobin is wasted in the process of carboxyhemoglobin so in a way there is functional deficiency of hemoglobin secondly these two naughty molecules right also interfere with the remaining hemoglobin and do not allow this hemoglobin to dissociate with oxygen readily so half of the hemoglobin is not carrying oxygen and whatever remaining half is carrying oxygen is not delivering oxygen efficiently so eventually tissue develop deficiency of oxygen. deficiency of oxygen, oxygen. and eventually there is hypoxia am i clear uh, then we come to stagnant hypoxia let me explain it uh, more clearly suppose this is a tissue here is arterial supply these are capillaries these are capillary and okay i make capillaries green so that you don't confuse them these are the capillaries and this is venous output this is any tissue and these are the tissue cells now how the stagnant stagnant hypoxia can develop either there is problem there is some obstruction here for example there is thrombus on arterial side or this compression of arterial side and there is dangerous reduction of circulation through this tissue so naturally there is very little blood here because more blood is not coming whatever blood is here is not draining well and it whatever oxygen is available it will be extracted by tissue and eventually there is no oxygen left to provide to the tissue and tissue will become hypoxic due to reduced inflow of circulatory blood or some people have normal arterial input to the tissue but they have a problem with venous outflow either veins are blocked by a thromb thrombus or embolus or veins are compressed by some external tumor or something so if there is severe reduction in venous outflow from a tissue then arterial blood under high pressure is pushing the blood initially but because blood is not going out of the tissue pressure in this area become very high and eventually circulation becomes stagnant and pressure in this area becomes so high that further blood cannot enter and then in a way stagnation develop whatever oxygen is there is utilized and eventually hypoxia develop am i clear now we come to the last cause of hypoxia histotoxic hypoxia some of you look relieved right last cause of hypoxia histotoxic hypoxia is very easy to understand because there are very few causes classical example is cyanide poisoning 
that uh, during cyanide poisoning, cyanide molecules go into the cell and bind with the cytochrome and certain enzymes uh, which are playing a big role in oxidative phosphorylation. So, uh, mitochondrion or cell are unable to utilize oxygen for aerobic respiration. Right, oxygen is there, but they cannot utilize oxygen. So, still metabolic process become oxygen poor. Right, this type of uh, situation is called histotoxic hypoxia. Am I clear? And sometimes this type of situation occur to some extent in beriberi. You know, beriberi is a condition in which there is deficiency of thiamine. And thiamine is play, this is the vitamin. Thiamine plays a very important role in some metabolic pathways in which oxygen is used. If there is severe, def, severe and prolonged deficiency of thiamine, then those metabolic pathways fail and that may also produce a slight degree of histotoxic hypoxia. Am I clear? But classical example remains cyanide poisoning. Now, before we really close the lecture, we also discuss what is the response of supplemental oxygen. If someone is severely anemic, if you give supplemental oxygen, will that elevate uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the blood? Answer is yes. Partial pressure of oxygen will be increased. My friends, use your all layers of cerebral cortex. Right? Listen, when you give, in a very severely anemic patient, if you give supplemental oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen in alveoli is raised. So, partial pressure, uh, dissolved oxygen will slightly increase. Dissolved oxygen is slightly increased. Normally, in 100 ml, there is only 0.3 ml carried. So, it may become 0.4 or 0.5. But there is no, but total oxygen which is transported, total content of oxygen is not significantly increased. So, in a very severely anemic patient, giving uh, oxygen does not significantly increases the oxygen transport from the lung to the tissue. You have to correct anemia if you really want some action there. Is that right? Then we come to stagnant hypoxia. Someone has severe congestive cardiac failure. Right? Circulation is moving very, very slowly. Do you think giving oxygen will very significantly raise the partial pressure, uh, significantly raise the oxygen supply to tissue? No. But there is about 10% increase in oxygen supply. And stagnant hypoxia in congestive cardiac failure patients especially. If you increase the oxygen pressure here, dissolved oxygen slightly increase, there is no big increase in supply of oxygen to the tissue, there is no big benefit, but sometimes the small increase in oxygen may be a matter of life and death for the patient. That is why still in congestive cardiac failure we give oxygen. Is that right? But what you have to remember that in congestive cardiac failure, uh, hypoxemia is not completely eliminated by giving supplemental oxygen. Is that right? Then, of course, we come to histotoxic hypoxia. Histotoxic hypoxia, again, you have to manage the underlying cause. Giving a lot of oxygen here does not help because already alveolar oxygen is normal, transport mechanisms, everything is normal. Problem is with the tissue, which is unable to utilize oxygen. Do you have any question? Okay, class dismiss. Thank you. Now, in the end, one part of cause of hypoxia which we missed, let's discuss that. When we were talking about the causes of hypoxic hypoxia, right, there was one important mechanism of hypoxia that is when there's problem with this gas exchange membrane, right? Either this is thickened or it has reduced surface area, right? there will be hypoxia. Why? The classical example is a disease called emphysema. A disease called <coughs> emphysema. What really happens in emphysema, let me tell you. Let's suppose that this is a system of air pockets and air is coming from here and of course going also. And in the walls of these air pockets, these are what? your vascular channels. These are your vascular channels. Now what really happens in emphysema that destructive enzymes are produced in the lung for a long time, especially elastases and those enzymes destroy these interalveolar septa. 
and when these interalveolar septa are destroyed, what really happens that alveoli become like this and total you know because this part of the septum is lost so all the this surface area is lost you know this surface area is lost this surface area is lost this surface area is lost so eventually what happened it becomes like this alveoli look like this right so in a way total surface area for the exchanges is reduced and in some other diseases which are called interstitial lung diseases what really happens that these septa become so thick that air cannot uh, gas cannot be exchanged well in between the alveolar space and the blood so either this membrane is reduced as it happens in emphysema or it is very much thickened as it happens in interstitial lung diseases there is impaired gas exchange between the alveolar areas and blood pulmonary blood so what will be the result yes what will be the result in these patients that oxygen transfer is less so arterial oxygen will go down and carbon dioxide will progressively go up if these people but remember effect on oxygen is more effect on carbon dioxide is less Do you know why because carbon dioxide is 20 times or 25 times more soluble than oxygen so it still exchanges in early stages of the disease still still carbon dioxide can jump from the blood to alveoli efficiently the real problem start because oxygen cannot transfer from alveolar space to the blood right and arterial blood oxygen level goes down now in this patient uh, alveolar level of oxygen will be high partial pressure of alveolar oxygen will be normal maybe 100 but partial pressure partial pressure of arterial oxygen will be very low suppose 60 is that right because there is impaired transfer of oxygen so alveolar oxygen tension minus arterial oxygen tension this difference will increase is that right now you tell me that if you give supplemental oxygen will that help or not that will help that is, but you have to give really high concentration of supplemental oxygen because you will take this RT, uh, alveolar pressure from rather than 100 you make it let's suppose 170 right then what really happens you are give, by giving supplemental oxygen you are increasing the gradient of oxygen from alveoli to blood and it it will at least moderately increase the oxygen level in the blood am i right so in those patients who are truly hypoventilating oxygen giving oxygen dramatically increases oxygen level in the art arterial side but in patient who have problem with the gas transfer giving oxygen moderately not dramatically but moderately increases the oxygen level in the blood but patient who have shunts giving oxygen does not significantly or not at all increases the oxygen level to the blood little dissolved oxygen may increase is there any more question no question sure okay good luck thank you